privilege for us to welcome uh, uh, today our esteemed uh, colleague, uh, who is the independent uh, consultant uh, in the uh, World Bank. And we are really uh, happy uh, for him uh, that he could spare, despite the time difference, uh, from uh, uh, from the U.S. and uh, from the country where he belongs to. Uh, now he's going to speak on public-private partnership for sustainable irrigation. What can be the role of uh, government, users, and the private sector? Very important topic for our agricultural universities, for our ICR colleagues, for the students, and for the scientists. Uh, Steve, for your information, uh, today's lecture uh, is the ninth in the series, which we are conducting uh, 75 lecture series. And all the eminent persons have been called for this important uh, series. Uh, till now, we had in various domains, uh, including fisheries, including uh, natural resource management, including some general lectures for conservation, including some lectures for, uh, for motivation, and in times to come, again, we have very important lectures, which are attended uh, not only by the persons uh, through this Zoom, uh, but we have another platform, uh, which has been created recently, uh, and where you just need to log in once, and then you can listen whatever is being projected here. And uh, you can interact, and a lot of other things. And you can have all the uh, past uh, lectures in that particular platform. Uh, that is the 75 ISA lecture series uh, uh, website. I'll just share you with the, with the chat box. And uh, this, uh, we are organizing this 75 lecture series just to commemorate this uh, 75th year uh, of India's independence, which will fall on the 15th August 2022. And till that date, we will have these 75 lectures. So we are very much thankful to you, uh, Steve for uh, accepting our request and for agreeing to deliver talk on this important topic. And uh, I request all the audience, all the participants, honorable vice chancellors, our directors, assistant director generals, deputy director generals, uh, to please, uh, if they have any questions, they can write in the chat box. And after his talk, we will have uh, the question answer session where we can uh, have uh, all those questions which are being put up in the chat box. Uh, so with that, uh, Steve, I once again uh, request you uh, to uh, kindly start your lecture, please. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Dr. Agarwal. Thank you very much for inviting me. Are you seeing the screen? Yes. Thank you. Okay, um, good afternoon, good morning, colleagues. What I'd like to talk about today is public-private partnerships for sustainable irrigation, or perhaps more widely, what are the roles of government, users, and the private sector? Let's start with that. What is the role of government in irrigation? I think it's essential to bear in mind that irrigation is fundamentally an economic activity. Farmers irrigate to make money. Sometimes farmers are growing for their own production, but I find wherever I am in the world, farmers are selling at least some of their produce to make money. Even in the poorest parts of Afghanistan, farmers are producing to sell to make money. And countries irrigate to make money. They have concerns of food security and rural development, but very often irrigation is focused on high value crops aimed at export. So farmers are irrigating to make money, countries are irrigating to make money. So money is the end, water is merely a means to the end. Then let's step back a bit from irrigation. More generally, what is the role of government in agriculture in a market economy? The underlying principle of a market economy is that in most areas, private firms do a better job of delivering goods and services than government. Not in all areas, but in most. And they only do so where the conditions are right. 
And this gives us three fundamental roles of government. First of all, government needs to make markets work. Left to their own, if you have a market, you're going to get cheating and bullying. You go to buy a 50 kilo cycle 20, 20, 20 fertilizer. You want it to be 50 kilos, not 48. You want it to be 20, 20, 20, not 18, 17, 16. But a farmer doesn't travel around with a set of scales in the chemical laboratory. Government has to make it a guarantee that you're getting what you're paying for. Turn it the other way around. You sell your milk to the dairy and you're paid on fat content. You can't test the milk. You're relying on it being tested fairly. You buy a pesticide. You want to know it's safe and, it, and that it works. You need government to guarantee that. You buy breeding livestock or semen. You want them to be disease free. Agriculture. The recording has stopped. Agriculture is a complex and scientific area. This meeting is being recorded. And government has a lot to do to make the markets work. Government also has to provide public goods, things like um, research and information that the public sector, for various reasons, private sector won't necessarily provide. Government has to step in, and we'll look at a moment at some specific gaps there. And having done those two things, government has one more job to do, which is to get out of the way and not to tinker, not to tell people what to grow or where to grow it, what the prices should be. Government's job is one and two. Now that's general. That goes for agriculture in the market economy, any sector, anywhere in the world. Let's see how that applies in the specific area of irrigation. In terms of providing public goods, there's a vital role of protecting the environment. Irrigation can do a lot of good and a lot of harm in terms of water pollution, damage to soil. Also, government has to manage the public water resource. It has to balance the interests of competing water users, urban consumers, farmers, upstream farmers, downstream farmers. And where we're looking at water using a, a fossil aquifer, the implications now can affect future generations. Government has to balance future generations with today's users. The private sector won't do that. It's an essential role of government. Then we have cross-boundary agreements. Many of the, the largest irrigation systems in the world feed off rivers that cross boundaries or form boundaries. These require agreements across the border with upstream and downstream users. Governments have to represent their country in this matter. And finally, government, or whatever level from a local council to a national government has an essential role in providing infrastructure that's too large for any one farm or firm to do. And this is particularly true for the conveyance and distribution of surface water. So that's the public goods end. And in terms of making markets work, government has to ensure fair play in what is a fundamentally uncompetitive market for irrigation services. When you buy fertilizer, you've got multiple suppliers. And they can sell to you or they can sell to someone else. If we have an irrigation system in an area, you as a farmer have no other supplier. You either buy from that uh, irrigation supplier or you don't have water. And the supplier can only sell to the farmers in the command area. They can't go off and seek new markets elsewhere. So we lack the basic element of competition. So there will always be a role for government regulation to make the market work. In irrigation. So that's the, the context. How have government addressed this issue? Governments addressed this issue. First of all, we need to make a distinction between the two main forms of irrigation. What I call individual irrigation is where one farm abstracts the water, distributes the water, and uses it to grow crops. This is very much the case of farm boreholes all around the world. This is economically a very efficient system. We're moving water short distances. Very often the aquifer is doing the long distance conveyance. Typically, the water is used on high value crops. Farms don't go to the cost of drilling boreholes and in installing equipment unless they've got a high value use. And we have no unused capacity. 
we're not running a pipeline or canal past two unirrigating fields to get to the third irrigating field. Farmers target the system exactly where they need it. It's economically very efficient, but it can easily lead to overuse of water, particularly um, groundwater if it is not well managed. And of course, it's not an option for everyone. If you don't have shallow groundwater or you don't have a river running next to your farm, you simply don't have the option for individual irrigation and in some form of organization is required. That takes us into multi-user systems where you have typically have a large system that abstracts the water, conveys it sometimes tens or hundreds of kilometers and distributes it. And then the individual farms apply it and use it. These systems can serve very large areas, but they are institutionally challenging. Much of the work I've done with the World Bank in irrigation in recent years has been trying to help solve some of the institutional challenges of large multi-user systems. So what kind of challenges has government got? On the individual irrigation, the basic challenge is to implement a fair and efficient permit system. I've just been analyzing data for Serbia. We have 186,000 um, water users, of whom six have direct contacts with government. Some are served through an institution, the vast majority operating outside the law. But most of them irrigate less than one hectare. They use less than two and a half thousand cubic meters of water. If they paid the permit fee, it'd be around a dollar a year. It would cost more to collect than the money's worth. So it's impossible to implement a complex system for all those small farms, yet we have some people irrigating tens and hundreds of hectares who have a big impact on the water table. So we need to find a system that is both fair and targeted and efficient. That's a major challenge, and I'm not sure many governments have yet solved it optimally. And when we come to multi-user irrigation, the challenge is to build efficient and responsive institutions, because government institutions are not renowned for being either efficient or responsive to customers. Many approaches have been tried over time to get solutions to those problems. And I'll discuss an evolution. Not every country had all these stages, but I'll identify five stages. We have a socialist economy model, then the post-transition model, then the phase of irrigation management transfer, various forms of public-private partnership, and hybrid models. And I want to step through those and see how they work economically at each stage. So here we have a picture of the socialist economy model. So here we have the non-farm private sector, the government sector, and private farms. Under socialist systems, Irrigation was almost entirely targeted at government farms, cooperatives or state farms. So government designed the system through government uh, design institutes. It built it through government owned companies. It maintained and operated through government water agencies. And then finally, it ran the farms. Everything was under one roof and the transfer pricing between the different uh, layers typically had almost no economic rationale. You could find this throughout the Soviet Union. You could find it in Yugoslavia and in other parts of the world. What happened then in the first post-transition phase? Two levels of privatization occurred. The design institutes tended to be privatized and the big engineering companies were privatized and the land was privatized. So we've now got a split. We have three different pillars here. What would typically happen then is that government would pay for design and building systems or rehab of systems. Government will continue to run the water supply agency, almost always with subsidy, and then the farmer would pay to government for its water. The issues we have, very often we have poor service. These state agencies tend to be inefficient. One I know in Ukraine is a state agency for water resources, it had at its height more employees than the entire National Army of Belgium, a massive institution with considerable political power and very little interest in individual farms. 
almost always, the fees were set low. Farms under the state system had been used to cheap or free water. They resented paying high prices. Government wanted to keep farmers happy to accept low fees. So there was not enough money coming to pay for the system. The government had to subsidize it. But government has other things to do. So when it runs short of money, it doesn't maintain properly. That means the system is underfunded, it deteriorates, and the farmers are even less willing to pay for core service. And that is this dilapidation cycle that we can find around the world. One of the solutions put up to address that was irrigation management transfer, where we've taken some of the maintenance and operation and we've passed it over to the farmers themselves in water users associations or wars. There are many examples around the world. I'm aware of some in South Caucasus, in Bulgaria, in North Macedonia. What happens here, still government is paying the engineering side, the private sector. Government is still running the long distance conveyance and subsidizing that. And the farmer pays indirectly. The farmer pays to the war, and then the war pays to the government. We typically have a, an ongoing problem of underfunding. The idea is that a war is owned by its members and they set the fee to cover the level of service they want. Very often that doesn't happen. Government intervenes, it tries to cap the price, it then makes the war dependent on subsidy. So the war is serving two masters. It serves the farmer and it serves the government. And it's neither one thing nor the other. And very often we have a continued problem of underfunding at the conveyance level. So irrigation management transfer has often improved things, but not solved all of the problems. Then various models of public-private partnerships. We can have the models where basically everything is done by the private sector, design, build, maintain, and operate, and the farmer just uses it. I couldn't find, and nor could my colleagues name, any system in the world that does this entirely without government support. There's always an element of subsidy. And we'll look at a couple of systems later, the El Gadane scheme in Morocco, the Canal de Navarra in Spain. So again, we have government paying for the design and build, but now we have a relationship. The farmer is paying for the operator who's getting some of their money back through a tariff or concession fee. So at least there is an incentive for the, the operator to respond to the farmers. Subsidy may come in different ways, often in multiple and complex ways. Again, we tend to have underfunding from the farmer. And again, we don't have a competitive market. So government is always regulating, typically through its original concession agreement. Then we have systems where the private sector designs, builds, and may maintain. It does the, the hard work. It runs the diggers and the, um, the engineers, but government does the soft side. It allocates the water, it sets the fees, it works with the farmers. This system is found in, in Vojvodina. Now, I'm not actually sitting in the US today, I'm sitting in Serbia, so this is a system I know quite well. So, but here we have the farm is paying for a government institution, and we've broken the link with the, the maintenance. So they have a control over the operation, not the maintenance. It, it's a halfway house. The state agency may still not be very responsive. I would actually say in Boivadina, where they have quite big farms, the system works reasonably well. But if we wanted to make the farmers more involved, having more say in their destiny, we could take some of the operation and move it out to the woods. So we could have woods working at the local level. Farmer pays the work, war pays the operator. So we've got more control for farmers. It should be more responsive, but we still have issues with fees and stuff to do. What may happen here is that the... Wars are not always good at maintaining complex systems. The war may not have experienced engineers and heavy machinery. So sometimes they will actually contract that back out to the private sector. 
to do the hard stuff and they will do the operation, the scheduling, the allocation, the payment. And that can be quite a good option for small wars. Again, we need to have enough income to make things work. So I've traced through several different models and you can see there are many little nuances there. If you go in and study the different examples of, of PPPs, and a colleague of mine analyzed them, he found 29 models in the Mediterranean and North Africa region. Every one has different details of the concessions, the tariffs, there's every possible arrangement. I think we can see here that none of them is perfect, but they have their strengths and weaknesses. So people need to find the best one for their particular conditions. That said, we still find that PPPs are quite rare in irrigation. They're common in water supply and sanitation and increasing, but why are they still rare in irrigation? Partly because the volume of water varies greatly. Uh, water availability varies according to rainfall, farmers' demand varies according to rainfall. So any concessionaire who depends on selling water will have a very fluctuating income stream. And one thing you see when you look at PPPs is risk, risk sharing, risk allocation is a fundamental part of the, the negotiation to deal with this inherent variability. We also find that farmers are very often used to cheap water. They've either been supplied it by the state at a subsidized price, or they've pumped it out of the ground and not paid for it. So they will often be resistant to paying enough money to meet the full costs. So government has to step in. And they may also have learned that even if they don't pay, they still get the water. Once that's become a habit, it can be very hard to get high collection rates. So this is another element of risk. So often the government has to underwrite the risk to the concessionaire, what happens if farmers don't pay? It's also important to note that a PPP can be quite an expensive way to borrow money. A government can typically borrow from the World Bank or another IFI at something like 5% per year. No commercial company is going to take all the risk and complexity of building a massive multi-million irrigation scheme to make a 5% return on their investment. They're looking to get a lot more money back. So it's expensive money. So the trade-off you are hoping for is that the increased efficiency of the private sector will more than compensate for the increased return they're looking for for their money. And we have to look in practice whether that trade-off actually works. So let's look then at three concrete examples. So I'll start with one I mentioned, El Gadana in Morocco. This is believed to be the world's first irrigation PPP. Um, much of the finance came from the IFC. It covers 10,000 hectares, and its goal was to replace expensive pumping from deep and declining aquifers. The aquifers were going down at about two and a half meters per year. We got to the stage where farmers were lifting water 300 meters, and it's costing 20 cents a cubic meter. 90 kilometers away, there was a dam with a lot of surface water. So if we could get the water there, in the end, it's being supplied to the farmers at 12 cents a cubic meter. So almost half price. Here's the system, the large dam and a 90 kilometer pipeline. What's very important there is it's mainly used for high value crops, citrus. There's a very effective marketing system. Most farmers sell to a, co um, a cooperative. They know they can sell what they grow and they know they get high returns to water. So that's made farmers much more willing to pay a realistic price because they know what water is worth to them. Even so, the investment was nearly half from the public sector, 44 fire votes, an 8% uh, advance payment by the farmers. That was really there as a test of willingness. If we build this, will farmers take it up? So the farmers had to prepay. And only when there was sufficient prepayment did this in go ahead. I've seen that done in other places as well, and it's very often a good way to do things. Consortia bid for this, and they bid on one thing, the water tariff. So the consortium that offered 
the lowest water tariff over the implementation period was collected. As well as the 48% subsidy in the construction, the government also offered grants for on-farm irrigation equipment, which came in practice close to 100%. So there's still a lot of, um, a lot of subsidy in the system, but it's generally perceived as quite successful. It's fully subscribed by farmers. The more farmers who, who didn't come in originally would like to come to the system, and they can't because it's already delivering as much water as it can. So expensive, subsidized, but technically and socially successful. Rather well, less successful, we can look at the West Delta project in Egypt. And again, the aim was to replace the fleet aquifers. The investment plan here, 84% public, 14% private. The irrigation area was not clearly defined, somewhere between 25 and 38,000 hectares. Preparation and negotiation were slow and complex. And this has been a recurring theme with DPPs. Complex commercial negotiations, typically that government institutions don't have experience of. And this has often been a real problem. It was affected by the political turmoil in Egypt, and in the end, only one bid was received, the project not what we call a success. The final example I'll take is in Spain, Canal de Navarra, and this is a large multi-purpose system. It aimed to provide water supply to 350,000 people, to produce hydropower, generating 6.5% of the region's electricity and also to irrigate 59,000 hectares. Here you can see the large main canal, and from the dam and reservoir here, a first phase to here which has been built, and a planned second phase. When all is built, this will supply over 20 communities. So it's a large, expensive and institutionally complex scheme. The major infrastructure, was 100% financed by government, a split of uh, central and regional government. And the PPP just came in at the level of irrigation distribution. And the investors were part private and part farms. A substantial irrigation subsidy here. 92% of the cost of the distribution system and all the cost of the conveyance system. Farmers have to put up an initial subscription fee to show their commitment. And an annual fee, 350 hec euro per hectare. This is not small. It works out about five cents a cubic metre. And the thing is that most farmers are using the water for low value maize. Typically, irrigating maize increases your margins by maybe 600 euros per hectare per year. So the irrigation is, is taking half of the farmer's benefit. And what we see here, very different from the citrus system in El Gadani, the whole thing is economically marginal. And also because of its complexity with these 20 plus communities, they formed local water users associations to represent hundreds of farmers to the concessionaire to negotiate and ensure that their interests are represented. So again, this is seen as being technically successful, but economically it's highly questionable. But we've looked here at, at the role of the private sector in these complex PPPs, but there's actually much more that the private sector can do and does do. The private sector is the main source of the design, the supply and installation of on-farm irrigation systems. And there are some extremely skilled companies there. And this is a very competitive market. If somebody has a product that's better than their competitor, they will take market share. So they are highly motivated to do a good job. Private firms are also very good at innovating in, in the digital space and developing tools and services for farmers. Things like irrigation scheduling apps, precision farming technologies. But the private sector can also support government with tools for water resources monitoring and tools for modeling and planning. I think there's much more there that could be done um, where government can do jobs for farmers. So finally, let's draw some conclusions. If we look at the scope for 
PPPs or more generally the private sector in irrigation supply. I would argue that full privatization is impossible. Government always has to regulate, and it usually has to subsidize, usually 100% of cases I've met. But the private sector clearly can design and build, and it does a good job of maintaining. Private sector can also operate, but government has to share the risk. And the options are much wider where irrigated agriculture is economically profitable, like our citrus, much more limited where they're marginal, like our maize. So we need high value crops and effective marketing. And we find that farmers are much more willing to pay realistic fees where the alternative is either expensive water or no water. Users must be involved from the beginning, from the design and all the way through. And the private sector can also support irrigation in many other ways, not just PPP, that's one of the things we can do. And my general recommendation, I would think to any government, is to focus on economic profitability first. Your system must be economically profitable and it must be financially sustainable. And then you can look at the options for funding and the various ways of building your financial model. There are many tools we can use to assess economic profitability and financial sustainability, but that I think is a seminar in its own right. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Steve, for the wonderful talk, beautifully explaining the models of this public-private partnerships and other models of uh, socialist economy, the transition model, and a lot of uh, things you have uh, covered in a very short time. Uh, I must appreciate uh, the input, the, the kind of information which you have provided to all our audience. And I'm sure they will be greatly benefited with this. And the recommendations are uh, Steve, which you have given, that we should keep profitability first uh, in all these models. So thank you very much for this wonderful talk. We have a uh, few uh, questions. Uh, if you allow, we can uh, take up those questions. The, the first uh, query is, you know, there is a province called Bihar. This question is from Asutos uh, Upadhyay. And uh, uh, Mr. Asutos uh, says that in Bihar, 30% uh, of the revenue collected is supposed to be given to government and 70% remains with the WUS for operation and maintenance of the canals. Unfortunately, only 30% is collected from the water users to deposit to the government. Due to this, there is no maintenance of canal. What may be the possible options to increase the revenue collection? This is an unfortunately common story. Uh, we found examples of this all over the Western Balkans and other countries. Um, it's often also a vicious cycle because when you have this underfunding and poor maintenance, farmers get poor service and they feel, why should I pay? Because I can't get water when I need it. Uh, what we would recommend is when you have a good system, so when you've rehabilitated, you have to go for full cost, uh, full payment. And you have to be tough. The war has to disconnect people who don't pay. And it has to be a decision of the farmers to do that. But you need to do that from the beginning while the system is, is still good. Once farmers are, are disappointed with the service, it's gonna be very hard to get yourself out of that position. So I think you, you have to tackle that one from the beginning. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Steve. The another question is from the Tamil University, uh, director of from there. And he says that in India, one of the fundamental problem is small holdings of less than two hectares, which I think you know. Water markets are absent or poorly developed. Is there any water market model with these small holdings? That's a difficult one. Um, there are a lot of places where, where wooers are successfully supplying small farms, small holdings. It can be done. Um, it works well, say, in Albania, where you've got lots of small farms in between the reservoir and the sea. What's important is that you need to have almost all of the farms using irrigation. 
because if you've only got a few of them growing high value crops and using irrigation, you spend a lot of money moving water past the two fields that don't irrigate to get to the one field that does. But where you've got a, a concentration of farms in one place growing high value crops, then you can often get good marking systems. Traders will come there or cooperatives will come. So I think you can work with smallholders where you've got a, a, a concentration of high value crops. But if the smallholders, most of them growing low value crops, is much more marginal, I think <laughs> you'll find it hard to make a multi-user system work. And really, this is where farmers have to rely on local sources and boreholes if water is available. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Steve. Uh, now, there is a question from Dr. D.S. Uh, Bundela, our own institute. Uh, he's the scientist there. Which PPP model is more suitable uh, to Indian irrigation system from practical and economic point of view? Do you suggest some model for Indian situation? I think what we've seen there is each, each of them has got their... Um, has got their strengths and weaknesses. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't go for any one model. And I, I don't think even the you know, FAO or the people who analyze it, they don't come out saying this is the model. They always talk about the strengths and weaknesses and you need to look at the, the conditions there. I think some, some common rules are, it's very hard to retrofit a, a PPP. It's much more likely to work when you're building a new scheme from scratch. So you can design it from the beginning. Uh, it's essential to put the users in the first place and make sure that they're going to be properly represented. So you've, you've got to have that, um, the user level right. And within that, then I think you've got a fair amount of flexibility in, in which PPP model you take. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Steve. The last question is uh, from uh, Mr. Vijay Kumar. And his question is, the water table in Haryana, Haryana is one of the provinces in India, is declining drastically, particularly in the area where rice wheat is, uh, is fallowed. But do you think there is a rationing of water users and charges from the, use, from the user so that the use of excess water can be avoided? This is a very good, a very good question. And it's a very common one. And you saw as the Two of the three systems we looked at today, they were trying to solve the problem of declining water tables. And I've met them in Cyprus, I've met them in Jordan. What is often the, the, the theoretical solution is you meet a water and you charge farmers for it. So it encourages farmers to use it um, efficiently. The problem is farmers have often become used to getting water for free and they resent they resent paying and it can be very hard to police. So farmers feel it's unfair when government steps in to charge them. But actually the, the farmers are the loser. If your water table drops by two and a half meters every year, every irrigating farmer is having to pay more to pump each year. So the farmers are their own worst enemies. Uh, but it, it's a hard problem to solve. I think this one needs to be solved with farmers, perhaps setting up a, a a war in a region, and I would, I would like to look at models where a farmer has the option to not irrigate and to get a fee for the to get a um, be compensated for the water they haven't used. So take on the idea that a farmer has some right to water that he can transfer to somebody else. So you would tend to allocate water to farmers who grow high value crops rather than low value crops, but you keep the idea that this water belongs to farmers. It's our water. We as a group of farmers will use it sustainably, but it, it's our water. I can see a, a lot of institutional issues there to make it work, but I think this is perhaps one of the important areas to push now because surface water systems, big multi-user systems don't work everywhere. Somewhere we only have groundwater. And I think solving that, that problem um, that our colleague has identified is perhaps one of the, the critical areas to be addressed now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve, uh, for uh, responding to the queries of our audience. They are all eminent persons who are involved in this uh, irrigation, who are involved in the agriculture. 
So I, I hope uh, it could have been a very useful talk uh, for the benefit of our, our audience. Now, uh, may I request uh, any uh, vice chancellor if they have uh, some uh, points to make, uh, Dr. Praveen Rao, Dr. Rajendra Prasad, or some, some other uh, colleagues from our universities. Sir, uh, uh, good afternoon, sir. Uh, sir, it is a wonderful uh, you know, presentations and other things. Uh, in fact, uh, we have started some kind of uh, public-private partnership, uh, especially in the water management, where uh, the new technology, the sensor and uh, submergible, uh, you know, drip and all those things, uh, we started. Uh, certainly, the public-private partnership is going because we would like to increase the area under the same amount of water. Uh, that way, we have done. And even in the cash program, sir, and uh, we had uh, that was inaugurated by our honorable DG sub also, where how exactly the private people can be participated and, uh, you know, uh, give the technology. So this is how we are blending. So certainly today's uh, the presentations has helped us to strengthen those areas. Uh, this is what I would like to say, sir. Uh, really, it's a good. Another thing, uh, the one more question, it is almost related to the and the questions, uh, last question they have asked, uh, same situations we have in certain command area where, you know, we cannot, uh, you know, change their, the mindset of the farmers because they go for either sugar cane or the paddy. Uh, these are all the things and uh, many times, uh, even uh, because of this mono, these two crops, uh, the, the canal water was being used, still the people uh, are you know under bankrupt and some people used to get uh, you know suicides are more in these areas i think certainly the involvement of the private sector in this there how exactly we can divert this water uh, to for the more productive crops and the different uh, cropping pattern that is uh, one of the points which i would like to take from your representations thank you sir thank you thank you dr Ajayin prasad sir uh, Dr. Praveena, you, you want to say something? Uh, first of all, uh, let me let me appreciate uh, the wonderful presentation made by uh, Steve. Uh, two or three issues I think I can uh, uh, highlight to the for the knowledge of the Steve under uh, Indian conditions what we have. As on today, uh, out of the total irrigated area, what we irrigate nearly two thirds of is under uh, uh, groundwater management. That is, uh, that is an important issue which we have to look at. Two third, nearly 65% of the area is under groundwater. That is number one. Number two is that, uh, uh, say with regards to whatever water we say low efficiency, but uh, when we look at a basin wide on a basin scale, that is not a water loss. It surfaces at some other place. So you have to consider the total basin-wide, uh, say what you call uh, uh, water resource when we are talking of uh, efficiency and all that. Uh, now the coming back to the social angle, uh, yes, participatory management, water user associations, uh, say what you call these are all the things which. You, uh, actually, as you know, that uh, some of the difficult challenges that we face, but uh, some of the models suggested by you, I think they have a place which we have to look at uh, taking as a uh, case study on a distributory basis and uh, take it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Praveen, uh, Praveen Rao Sahib. Uh, he is the vice chancellor of one of the very prestigious university uh, in uh, Telangana, uh, PJT SAU. And uh, before that, Dr. Rajinda Prasad was also one of the, uh, is also one of the uh, vice chancellors of the prestigious uh, university. So uh, may sir, I have uh, sir, a question? Sir, from one the... second, sir, sir. I wanted to add yes. one more thing, sir. Sir, in the Indian situations, uh, because of the fragmentations, the size of holding is, you know, it is more than 80% is almost small and marginal farmers. In that system, I think uh, some of the models they have proposed. Can we go instead of uh, the PPT only, the PPPR, uh, the cooperative system can be adopted. They make, maybe can we adopt one village yeah. for this one? 
can we have a system wherein uh, let us uh, share equally uh, among all the people maybe i am having one acre maybe two acre something like that uh, if it is the model is there that really it works out well sir for the our situations sir steve do you want to say something no i mean i think your point is is a very good one each situation is different and you understand the indian one cooperatives in my experience have a um, an overtone, a, a, a connotation. And there are some parts of the world where farms accept them and they work well. And where I'm sitting in Yugoslavia, people were forced into cooperatives for decades and they almost, it's like they, they developed an allergy to them. So it's harder to make them work. But if you if you can make them work, then it can be a very good solution for this. You know, we've talked about how important it is to have the farmers involved and be responsive to them. And if you can make a cooperative do that and perhaps support the marketing as well, which is often the, the bottleneck for high value crops, I think that can be a good way forward. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Now, yeah. uh, one last question we are uh, taking from Dr. Vijay Kumar, who is the consultant, faculty, and retired principal scientist, soil scientist, uh, and is uh, presently working in Marana Pradap Horticultural University, Karnal. Uh, Dr. Vijay Kumar, please be brief. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Steve. It was really nice presentation. Uh, I would just, I wanted to highlight the problems like in Haryana, we have two situations. One is where the water table is declining and another, uh, the part of what is that the, the water table is coming up. So mm -hmm. both the situation are tedious, means uh, you, you cannot stop the farmer to use less water or you cannot ask the farmer to uh, use more water. So the, uh, the, these things, how you tackle these situations? I just wanted to have your comment. Yes, I'm glad you touched on drainage. On irrigation, so we've got these two systems. We've got individual irrigation and multi-use irrigation. But I mean, there is no individual drainage. I can only pump water out of my field if the river or ditch is going to carry it away. And if that infrastructure isn't there, no farm can drain on their own. So you, you always have a fundamental requirement for some kind of organization of people for drainage. So what we can call governance, whether it's a you know, local municipality or a much bigger system. And if government doesn't come in and make that work, it won't happen. I think that's an absolutely critical role. Maybe I should have touched on it, but. Government has an essential role in drainage, but even more than in irrigation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. So with that, uh, we come to the close of this uh, session. Uh, please uh, again attend a lecture, which is day after tomorrow. And you can just uh, inform the students also. It's again on a very uh, important topic about, the, uh, about how to foster the enabling environment for the agribusiness. And that is by... Uh, Dr. Farbaud Yusufi, he is also a senior agriculture specialist and consultant uh, for the FAO and the World Bank. So with that, friends, we come to the close of this session. And thank you, Steve, very much. And thanks to 